I always feel very height challenged. Um, thank you, Shannon. I love you. You're like my new favorite person in the entire world. Before we end the night, can we have a huge round of applause for Shannon Kaysen? So I'm gonna tell a story about my parents. Um, in my group of friends, my, really mostly about my mother, my parents are very legendary. And they're legendary for a lot of reasons. Um, well, they're funny people. They really are incredibly entertaining. I have to describe them so that you really have a good context. My mom and dad are kind of like um, Archie and Edith Bunker meet the Sopranos. I think is a, is a good description. Uh, my dad, my dad's Italian, the last name Galuzzo, of course, and he's, um, he's very animated. Uh, he's 82 now. My father can't really hear very well, and he has a funny habit of repeating himself. So you would call home, and he would pick up the phone. He does this every single time, every single time. And he says, not hello or anything, he says, everything okay, everything okay? <laughs> and and I'm, every, I'm like, everything's great, Dad. And immediately I'm like, can I go, can I talk to Mom? Are you sure you're all right? You sure you're all right? Always with the repetition. I have no idea why. Um, I asked my brother one day, I said, what does Daddy say when you answer the phone? The same fucking question every time. Everything okay? Everything okay? <laughs> I'm like, Jesus Christ, Dad, why do you have to ask me that every single time? I'm like, I know, dude, I thought it was only me. He's like, no, it's both of us. So I don't, I don't know why he does this, but he does. He also has this funny little thing when he walks. It's actually very sad, and I don't mean to make fun of it, and I'm not poking fun of it. It's just, a, it's just factual. He has this disease where he's, he's very stooped. So when my father walks, he literally is like this. And, and he's more than 50% bent over. But then this odd thing will happen as he's trying to catch his balance, he's walking around, and he'll do this. Oh, Jesus Christ, this is tough, it's tough. And he'll, he'll stand up just like that. And, and every single time he does it, my wife will say to me, every, honey, did you see him? He just stood straight up. And then he's just, I don't, I don't know why, we really don't, we've been to lots of doctors, I don't know, he doesn't seem to be in pain. But it's very consistent, it's a real mystery. But I think, you know, that's, that's a good, some good context for my father. My, my mother uh, really is, I could tell nine hours of stories about my mother. She's, long story short, she's my hero. She's the most amazing person I have ever known. And uh, ironically, I don't think Ian's still here, but her name is Janet, kind of funny. Um, and we have that perfect, I love when he said the contentious mother-daughter thing going on. We're very spicy with each other. Um, I, she likes to say, it started from the first moment you came out of me. And so when I was born, I was, it was a very kind of violent birth, according to her. It was a tough, tough, tough delivery. We were fighting ever since that first moment. <laughs> I know, I know we were, I know. Um, so my, my parents have been married for 56 years. It will be 56 years this October, which is a tremendous feat for anybody. But when you consider that my mother has uh, she has progressive multiple sclerosis. It's actually called primary progressive multiple sclerosis. There's a, there's a commercial on TV I hate. I talk about it all the time to my spouse. It's, um, it's for a drug that treats remissive MS. And the woman on the commercial looks fantastic. She's like in a bathing suit and she's playing tennis <laughs> and she keeps changing clothes. and. It's this whole thing is this drug. It just keeps you from having MS attacks. And um, that's not what MS has looked like in our family. And it's not what it's looked like for my mom. And she's, she's had it since she was a young person. And uh, it's been a rough road. I mean, at this point in her life, my mom's been in a wheelchair for 25 years-ish. Um, her circulation is so bad, she lost her left leg in an amputation. Pretty much every organ in her body is affected, but her mind is unbelievably sharp, which is pretty amazing. And she's kept her sense of humor. And another reason she's pretty legendary, you caught a little bit of it before, she has this great, very authentic 
New York accent, which I like to mimic, as you can see. Um, and it's not a put on, that's exactly how she sounds. She also likes to drop the F-bomb, kind of like it's the word and, um, which I've really, I've, go I've grown to appreciate as an adult. When I was younger, I was like, could we watch the language a little bit? <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> if they don't like what I have to say, they can go take a shit somewhere else. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, and she likes to get in these like, crazy little situations. There's always a great story to tell about my mom. I, there's so many, so many little ones, but just to give you some context, I lost her in a department store once when she was in her wheelchair. I left her alone, parked in the wheelchair. I mean, I was like, how far could she go? I mean, we were in Neiman Marcus in New York. I mean, she wasn't like two rows over, she was gone. And I was actually very panicked. And when I finally found her, I was like, where did, how did you even get away? Did somebody push you? Now I used my cane as a paddle. <laughs> okay, I got it, good. So, uh, after they moved to Fort Lauderdale, she called me one day, she was very excited, and um, she's like, I have something to tell you. I was like, what? She's like, guess what I got today? I was like, I can't possibly imagine. What did you get today? She's like, I got my driver's license. <laughs> this was only five years ago. And I was like, okay, wait. Hold on, how did you get a driver's license in Fort Lauderdale? And she was really proud of herself. She had basically lied to and harassed the man at the Bureau of Motor Vehicle. And when he tried to take her picture, she was in the wheelchair with my dad, he was like, could you stand up so I could take your ID photo? And she said, no. <laughs> and he said, no, really, could you stand up? And she said, no. And he was like, can you drive? And she was like, have you heard of MS? And he was like, yeah, I have. She's like, sometimes I have an attack and I can't stand. This is one of those times. He's like, do you drive a car with adaptions? Yes, which was a total lie, by the way. <laughs> so she got the license. She was very proud of that. I was like, what are you going to do with it? I don't know. I just really like having one again. <laughs> so this is a good, good context of my parents. Um, so 56 years of marriage, right? But you know, like you're a little kid and you, you hear from your parents, like they have a life before you came around, you forget. And they knew people before they knew each other. And of course, there's a time in your life when you're really fascinated by those stories. And before my parents got married, there were of course other people in their lives. And my dad, for example, um, was engaged to uh, the German daughter of a, a general. In, in Berlin, he was stationed over there during his tour in the military, and so that was his relationship before he met my mom, and um, realized then, of course, you know, that obviously he wanted to marry my mom. Um, and my mother had this uh, very serious relationship with a guy we always only knew as Bobby. And the thing about Bobby is, um, so we grew up Catholic, and Bobby came from an Episcopalian family, and to me, <laughs> there's not a lot of difference in, I mean, I've been to services and mass, and I was like, I don't really, it's not hugely different in my world. Maybe religious experts are cringing right now. But um, Bobby's family did not like Catholics. And Bobby's sister had evidently married a Catholic boy, and the family had disowned her. And Bobby and my mother were deeply in love, and they legitimately wanted to get married, and... Bobby knew that they would not accept my mom, and she knew that. And she said, you know, I can't marry into a family where I'm not accepted, and she broke it off with him. And then, through a series of events, started dating my father. So Bobby never, you know, really lost his love for my mother and never forgot. And um, while my parents were dating, he wrote my mother the sort of last-ditch love letter, last-ditch effort at a love letter. And the letter said, I love you so much. I still want to be with you. I want to marry you. We'll get, we're going to make this work. It doesn't matter what our families think. And um, I really want you to be with me. And if you want that, uh, just contact me and let me know. If you don't answer this letter, then I will know that you don't want to be with me, that you're going to move on with your life. And I'm going to move on with my life. I'm going to uh, renew my term in the military, I'm going to empty my bank account and buy the car of my dreams, and I'm going to try to forget you. 
So this letter became kind of legendary, and my mom kept this letter, oh God, uh, to the second house we lived in when I was growing up. So I was like in my early years, and she, I just recently found out that she held on to the letter for a long time. So obviously she never answered the letter because she married my dad. Um, true to his word, uh, Bobby re-upped in the service. He did empty his bank account. He did buy the car of his dreams. It was a convertible. And he was showing off, driving around the base and kind of mishandling the car. And he flipped the car and he died. And my parents went to Bobby's funeral service together. My dad always said he thought Bobby was a really good guy. And somewhere in between the letter writing and his death, um, his accidental death, Bobby had bumped into my dad and he said, I know you're with Janet, I know she's your girl now, just promise me you'll always take really good care of her. So, fast forward many decades. Because of my mother's illness and because I haven't really lived at home since I got out of college, my mom and I have a great long distance relationship. We talk a lot on the phone, sometimes every day, not usually more than a day or two goes without us chatting on the phone. She called me one day, some years back, and she left a message, and she said in a whisper, call me as soon as you can. So, so I called her. Um, I said, hey mom, what's up? Oh my God, I've gotta talk to you. I was like, why are you whispering? You know, I don't want your father to hear. Okay, number one, he's deaf as can be. <laughs> number two, he's like, you're in the kitchen, I'm guessing. Yes. I'm guessing dad's asleep in the bedroom because it's like 11 o'clock at night. Yes. I'm like, you're four rooms away. Is a deaf man asleep in the bedroom. I don't think he's going to hear. What is going on? She's like, I feel like I'm cheating on your father. And I was like, okay, <laughs> think about this. Super weird. My head went to, you're in a wheelchair stuck in these four walls. You can't get out. You don't go anywhere without daddy. All you do is talk on the phone with people. And I was like, oh my God, she's falling in love with a telemarketer. <laughs> it, was, it was like bound to happen. Oh. So that wasn't it, thankfully. She's like, no, I had a dream. I was like, oh God, Jesus, this is going to be a sex dream? I don't want to hear that. Oh. I was like, is that about a daddy? I hope not. She's like, stop being funny. Listen to me. So she said, I had a dream about Bobby. And I said, Bobby? Like the dude that flipped the car and died, loved you, wanted to marry you, wanted to be with you, that Bobby? Yeah. I was like, what, what happened in the dream? Bobby asked me on a date. I was like, what? what'd you say? I said, yes. <laughs> Where'd you go? We went to the traveler's rest. Now. When I was growing up, one of the most romantic restaurants in town was the Traveler's Rest. And I was like, you mean the German restaurant with the big stairwell and the gardens in the back with all the lit evergreen trees? Yes. I was like, oh my god, seriously? She's like, we walked down the big stairwell together. He tried to hold my hand. I said, stop it. You can't hold my hand because I felt like I was cheating on your father. <laughs> I was like, what else happened in the dream? He tried to kiss me. I said, stop it, you can't kiss me, because I felt like I was cheating on your father. <laughs> and then she's like, by the way, you can never tell your father this. <laughs> like, to this day, my dad still doesn't know about Bobby. I was also sworn to secrecy for not telling my brother. <laughs> I'm swearing you all into secrecy <laughs> right now. <laughs> no telling. So, as it turns out, um, just to, to bring a little seriousness to that moment, um, my mom was very sick when she had had that dream about Bobby. And these days, anytime my mother is close to dying, and unfortunately that is more frequently than I would like to talk about, and through many hospitalizations and many emergencies and even dying on the OR table, every time my mom gets very close to death, she dreams about Bobby. She also dreams about a place, and her description of the place is phenomenal. You know, the, the description of the flowers and the colors and the smells, just about it being the most beautiful place that she could ever even hope to describe. 
And she's told me about all of this, you know, over the years. There was even a time when she had a dream about my grandmother, her mother, and Bobby arguing over who it was that should greet her when she arrived. And I said, wow, you know, that's crazy, Mom. What, what happened? And she's like, she basically said, Bobby won <laughs> because he reminded my grandmother that he had been waiting longer for my mother than she had been. So, you know, all these years of hearing those stories, and maybe you think it's kind of funny, you know, that my dad is still alive, and my parents are still together, and here my mom and I are sharing that, that moment, but I've kind of come to realize that in all these years of hearing those stories, it gave me something really wonderful. I started to feel some sort of sense of peace, and I started to feel more accepting of her passing on, and, and we're so close, but that has been my lifelong struggle. Um, you know, trying to live with the idea that I will lose her. Uh, and so this gives me something to hang on to. And it, it kind of occurred to me the other day that um, I think this is the last great lesson that my mom is teaching me, uh, which is about death and, and losing people and letting go. And for that, I will always be grateful to her, and I will always be grateful to Bobby. Thank you. <laughs>